This video is sponsored by DistroKid, an affordable and easy way to release your own music on digital platforms like Apple Music, Spotify and many others. DistroKid also has this totally free feature called HyperFollow, where you're setting up a landing page for your fans to go to to check out all your links to your music, your website or whatever like that. Mine is hyperfollow.com accurate. Here are links to my website, my YouTube channel, my Spotify account, my sample pack, everything like that in one single place. It's super simple to set up and totally free of charge. And if you want to know more about DistroKid, check out the link in my description below. Thanks a lot to DistroKid for sponsoring the video. For now, let's get into this home studio tour. Jump. Hello YouTube, it's Accurate again, back with another video from the home studio. And welcome to my home studio tour 2022. Let's get started. Yeah, so this video is going to be all about my home studio, right? And we're not talking about the recording studio, really. This is much more of a production studio. I'm a beat maker and an instrumental artist, so I'm not going to have like guitar amps or fancy mic pre's or anything like that. I work with samplers, synthesizers, drum machines, technology like that. So let's get into the gear. The synthesizers, the samplers, the drum machines, the audio interfaces, the MIDI controllers, the cables and all of that good stuff. Let's talk about the connectivity and the connections as well. This room in general and the small amount of acoustic treatment that I've done to it. And you know, my overall thought process behind setting this room up the way it is. I've had my struggles with this room and I think I've kind of made the most out of it as it is right now. Let's try to break this all down into one single video and there are also timestamps down below if you want to skip through to a certain part of the video for some reason. I also want to mention that I've covered most of the tech that I'm going to talk about in this video in other videos on the channel so feel free to go search for them if you want to know anything more about anything specific like that. And if you're in Europe like I am there is an affiliate link down below to my Tommen page where you can actually buy most of the stuff that I'm going to talk about. That gives me a little bit of a kickback if you end up purchasing anything from that link. So yeah, check that out if you want to. Now let's get into the stuff here. Let's start with the first thing, that's the actual room. And you know, this is just a normal spare bedroom in the apartment that I share with my daughter and my girlfriend. I have a neighbor underneath me and another one just on the other side of that wall, but no one lives on top, so that's, that's something, right? So this is the room from above, these are the walls and these are the measurements. So it's not huge by any means, but it works for me. And I have two different desks set up in here. The main wooden desk for my music production and editing needs, and another white desk by the window for shooting videos, doing unboxing, gear reviews and stuff like that. This one is also set up and prepared for me to put any piece of gear on here and make music like that too. Let's think of this setup and this desk behind me as the more permanent of the two. It's not permanent, I'm always going to replace one thing for something else for different situations, but that's just me and that's just what I do. The desk itself though is not as nice as it looks. This is all fake. Not all fake, but it's mostly fake. It looks nice on camera and it feels good in the room, I like it a lot, but it's actually a really old version of the IKEA Bekant desk that's not even being sold anymore. I picked this one up on the Swedish version of Craigslist one and a half years ago or something like that. Me and my dad fixed it up and now it looks like this. So the surface you see here is not real wood at all. Just one of those decorative plastic things you can put on things. Basically a big sticker that looks like wood. But to me it works and it looks good on camera and it feels good in the room so who cares. And the white desk setup right here is the opposite of that. It's not made to be permanent at all. This is supposed to change over time. Weekly, daily, per video or per project, whatever I need. This setup is quite modular like that. I don't have a modular synth but I do have a modular thing that I think is pretty cool. Now, the last thing I want to mention here that actually has to do with the room is the acoustic treatment. I haven't done much and I'm not an expert on this at all and what I've done isn't good enough. I know that. Most of my work in here is done on headphones though. I just use my studio monitors to like double check on a mix or to get a feeling for how a beat plays out. But again, I live in an apartment with neighbors. I can't be blasting music left and right day and night. That just doesn't work. So I'm headphones all the way, so the acoustic treatment isn't that important for music. 
It took me a few years, but now I have these thin foam panels on three of the walls. And they honestly don't do much, if anything at all, for the music making parts of things. However, when I record my voice talking to a camera like this, they do help with the reverb that was going on in here before. So that's nice. Not what I would recommend anyone to get for some proper acoustic treatment in a room, but in this case, they make a little bit of a difference, so that's something. But I do have a couple of acoustic panels in here that I built myself a couple of years ago, and I just put new fabric on them to match the setup over there. And that change actually improved the overall acoustics in the entire room for everything, just a little bit, but mostly when I make videos over there, it just didn't make sense to have two parallel walls like that without any acoustic treatment at all. You know, it kind of sounded like I talked straight into a shoebox or something like that. It sounded awful, and that just improved on that massively. And finally, yeah, I know that the placement of my studio monitors is way, 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 way off. But I am completely deaf on my right ear. I can't hear anything out of it, so that doesn't work. All the music I make is totally in mono, as well as the audio for my videos. So this might look like the work of a crazy person, but you know, it works for me and it is what it is. So yeah. All the beats I'm making here finally ends up on the computer, which is my M1 Mac Mini with 16 gigs of RAM, and that works really good for what it is. But I'm also waiting for my shipment of a 14 inch MacBook Pro with the M1 Pro chip and 32 gigs of RAM. I just need to future proof my computer setup, and I also really need a laptop because that's just life. In terms of audio interfaces, I'm using the Apollo X8 from Universal Audio as well as the AudioFuse 8 Pre from Artoria. The Apollo one does like the main parts of the heavy lifting, and the AudioFuse is hooked up over ADAT and gives me access to eight more inputs like that. So everything is controllable through the Universal Audio console software, and I can assign any of the inputs to any of the outputs. So if I want to sample the machine into the MPC or something like that, that's all done from the software. So that's nice and handy. Now let's get into the musical gear that's connected on this desk, and please again keep in mind that this is not permanent permanent, this is what happens to be connected right now. Things might change in a few days or weeks or whatever, but let's go from left to right and let's try to be a little bit quick with this because I can't go into the depth of anything here because there's a lot of stuff to cover, so yeah, let's go. First of all, this is the op from Korg, a relatively easy to use FM synthesizer with six operators. I use this one a lot for bass sounds, electronic pianos, and more crazy and strange kind of FM digital synth sounds that I use every now and then. It's fun and I use it a lot and it's strange in its own little way, but not impossible to understand, so that's kind of cool. Next up we have one of my daily go-to devices for beat making and sampling in general. This is the Machine Plus from Native Instruments, and this one is in this case set up to be used in standalone mode more than anything else, so that's what that is. Next to Machine, we have the Roland SP404 MK2 Sampler. It has its own little workflow to it, and I'm a big fan of it. It also has some really great built-in effects that also makes a lot of sense to use for live shows and stuff like that, so SP404 MK2, I'm a huge fan. Next up is the Rode Procaster mic, which is a dynamic microphone connected to my audio interface. I use this one mostly for live streaming on YouTube and Twitch and stuff, and to me this is a really good microphone in its price range. Next to the mic we have the M32 keyboard from Native Instruments, just a nice and simple MIDI keyboard with 32 keys connected to the computer over USB for whenever I need to use a MIDI keyboard on the computer. Next up we have the Roland Jupiter XM, which is just a smaller version of the Jupiter X that was released kind of at the same time as this one. It has all the same synth engines and the same sound to it, but it's smaller and a little bit trickier to navigate, but still a high quality instrument that I love a lot and I use for many, many different things. Then we have the Circuit Rhythm from Novation. This is a nice and simple groove boxy type of sampler that's also battery driven, so that's cool. Honestly, I need to spend a little bit more time with this one, but one day I'm sure I'm gonna dive deep into this one and get obsessed with it, because I know a lot of people are. Below the Jupiter and the Circuit Rhythm, I do have another one of my favorite devices at the moment. We're talking about the Akai MPC-1 right here. It's pretty much an all-in-one device that handles sampling, has a lot of synthesizers, built-in effects, and a sequencer that's really powerful. And you know, for most of the beats that gets made in here, the MPC-1 is involved in one way or another, so definitely one of my favorite devices, and that's why it sits where it sits on the disc. Hidden away behind my MPC-1, we have my video switcher, the V1 HD from Roland. 
This is a hardware video switcher that handles all my cameras and outputs everything into one single HDMI that goes into the computer and that just makes life a lot easier when it comes to live streaming. The next thing that's also a little bit hidden away, I guess, is this Native Instruments Complete Control S61 keyboard. It sits underneath the desk and gets pulled out whenever I need access to more octaves and a proper keybed. Now, the last piece of tech on this desk that I want to talk about is, of course, my studio monitors, the A5Xs from Atom Audio. Atom Audio is great at producing speakers in any size. I guess I could step up to the newer ones called A7Vs, I think. But these 5 inch ones is definitely good enough for a small room like this. I like them and I feel like all my mixes translates nicely between these and other speakers too, which is super important and cool. And I guess that's it as far as this main desk goes. And as you might have noticed already, I don't have a single MIDI connection going on here. And I have two reasons for that. One, I just don't need any more cables. There's enough of a bird's nest going on already here under my desk that I don't even want to talk about. But secondly, I've never really gotten used to relying on anything in terms of MIDI. MIDI notes, MIDI CCs or MIDI clock sources or anything like that. Not for a setup like this, at least. That's never really been a big thing for me. I wing things when it comes to timing and stuff. I just hit things at the same time and that normally works. If it doesn't, I'm just restarting stuff. It's not a live situation, right? I'm producing music. So basically I keep all my fiddling around with MIDI and clock sources and CV and gate values and stuff like that on the other desk that we're getting into soon enough. But first of all, let's talk about this Calyx shelf and the stuff that's going on over here. And you know, this is nothing too special. This is my Technics 1210 turntable that's connected to my Native Instruments Tractor Control Z2 mixer. And that's my setup for sampling vinyl, scratching and using it for a DVS setup with Tractor on the computer. And that's just solid. And to the right of that, I do have this extra space for a keyboard. And right now I have the Korg Wave State set up. This is a wave sequencing synthesizer that just provides me with a lot of evolving and changing and modulating sounds that adds a lot of dynamics to anything. So that's a nice one to have access to right here. This is also where I keep a part of my record collection and these are mainly records that I use for sampling purposes. Sure, I have some hip hop and some jazz and some funk and some of my mom's old pieces of vinyl too, by the way, which is nice. But the majority of the stuff here is just really cheap thrift store finds that I could find something on someday if I go for anything like that, you know? Nothing too fancy, but still stuff that are important to me as a person, as a producer, whatever. Now let's move over to the secondary setup too, the white desk, the YouTube studio, my dollars corner or whatever you want to call that. This secondary desk is right now set up for sound exploration and freeform jam situations or something like that. I'm playing a lot with the Moog's harmonicon at the moment and I'm triggering that from the sequencer on the MPC Live 2. So that together with the Microfreak, the Roland TR6S and the Polyon Tracker just becomes this endless playground for testing ideas and just spending a crazy amount of time, honestly. The point of this specific setup is not really to produce music right now. This is just a way for me to practice and develop as a producer. And as soon as I'm getting bored of any of this, I might switch this setup to include something like the MC-707, my OP-1, my old cassette portal studio, or whatever like that. This setup is also where I get things connected over MIDI, CV and gate and stuff like that in its own little ecosystem. That just fits me way better. Now, I'm definitely not a guitar player, but on these walls I have my super cheap P-style DIY electric bass guitar from Tommen that I just need to fix up someday. An acoustic guitar that I borrowed from a classmate of mine in school many, many, many years ago. So, Patrick, get in touch if you want this one back. That's yours, for sure. And here's also my entry-level Harley Benton Telly that I'm trying to get some usage out of, just for the fun of it. If I ever decide to really learn how to play the guitar properly, I will sure invest in better instruments than these, but for now, they are just fun to have around, you know? Last but not least, this bookshelf right here has some of the gear that I only use every now and then, but also stuff that I just enjoy having on display. This MPC 2000 XL, for instance, is such an iconic device that I really want to get more use out of mine. So it sits here to remind me to get back into it someday, and I will. 
Here's my Tanberg reel-to-reel tape recorder that looks amazing and sounds even better. And I only use it as an effect unit every now and then to route audio through to get some tape saturation onto my samples or my drums or something like that. Here's also the new compact series from Roland that I just made a video on. They're just cool stuff to have at hand. Down here is also my old Tascam cassette Porter Studio that has a unique sound to it and a very special workflow. It's just a cool thing to have around. Here's also the Mini Root 2S, the Drum Root and the Drum Root Impact, all from Arturia, that I used for a sample pack that I made a few months ago. So that's what that is. And here's also my Magnus chord organ that I made a video on a while back. I don't really use it much or anything at all, but it's here. And that also goes for this amp that I haven't even gotten around to try. And yeah, I think that's the most of a home studio tour I can give you at this moment. And that pretty much covers everything that's going on here. I do have this separate storage closet over here that has a lot of old synthesizers, computers, cables, cases, adapters, camera stuff that I just won't show you because it's pure madness and, you know, all to try to keep this space as clean as possible. Now, what's also a little bit funny and somewhat ironic is that just a few hours after I'm done with this video, I'm actually gonna leave home to go to a place to check out a studio space to rent. I've never had that before and I'm, you know, really enjoying myself in this home studio, but it's becoming a little bit small and it's becoming harder and harder for me to focus on these things and videos and music and stuff at home. This space that I'm talking about is close to my home and it's really affordable and it feels safe and secure and it could be cool to try something like that out. This could also become this series of videos on this channel so it could make sense in that case too. You know, having a home studio like this has its ups and downs. Sometimes it's awesome to just be able to go in here, sometimes it's hard to concentrate and focus, and sometimes it's honestly a little bit difficult to spend time on the couch just watching a movie because I kind of want to or need to or should be in here to work on stuff. But let's see how that whole process goes. Maybe that process will become a video in itself. I don't know. Thanks a lot for watching this video. Again, this might be my last home studio tour ever, so that's something, right? Don't forget to check out DistroKid, the sponsor, down below with the whole hyperfollow thing. It's really cool. Again, thanks a lot for watching. I hope to see you guys in the next one. Until then, ha det gott! Accurate beats. Accurate beats. Accurate beats.